And Mike Heiser received his Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Ancient Semitic Languages from the University of Wisconsin out there in Madison. He's earned two M.A. degrees in the fields of Ancient History from the University of Pennsylvania and Biblical Hebrew and Semitic Languages from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mike's graduate work has resulted in his ability to do translation work in more than a dozen ancient languages and dialects. He now works for Logos Bible Software, a company that specializes in software that analyzes the ancient biblical Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts, as well as other texts and other ancient languages. He's our special guest tonight on Coast to Coast. Hey, uh, Michael, welcome back. How are you? Hi, George. I'm really good. Thanks for having me back. Uh, always a pleasure. Sometime tonight, we've got to talk about this software and how it analyzes some of the ancient <laughs> biblical texts. This, that's incredible stuff, isn't it? Sure, it, it is. It is. I, I feel like the proverbial kid in the candy store. <laughs> well, that's good. Lots going on with the Da Vinci Code. Um, not only was the book a huge bestseller with close to 40 million copies sold. I predict the movie is going to be equally successful when it comes out in May. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some who are writing uh, Da Vinci hoax books, talking that the that you know the the Dan Brown theory is is not true. But but first and foremost, Michael, wasn't Dan Brown's book? Isn't it's primarily a novel? And so embellishing it is, of course, understandable, isn't it? Yeah, I think what what got him into, if you want to use the word trouble, was on the on the cover. It's plain, you know. It says a novel. You know, anybody who can read the cover is going to get that. But then on the inside, you know, there's something to the effect of, you know, he talks a little bit about his research, and then he more or less says everything that you're going to read here is meticulously researched and true, and so on and so forth. And then. You know, it, it sort of sets up this, you know, conflict uh, between, well, yeah, it's a novel, but look what he says here on, you know, right as we get into the story, you know, just before you even get into the, you know, the first chapter. So I think that's really part of what, you know, has led to the controversy around it. And of course, you know, Da Vinci himself, born in 1452, the man was a genius. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a painter, he was an architect, engineer, mathematician, philosopher. I mean, he, 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 yeah, he, he did it all. But there are so many people who believe that a lot of his work was done in code. Now, there's an equal camp, Mike, who believe, no, that's nonsense. What side of that fence are you on? I'm, I'm sort of, well, I'm kind of in the... Now, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm in the exact middle, but I'm kind of in the middle. Um, let me explain why I say that. Okay. On the one hand, there are, there are very sound, understandable, coherent, uh, responses to, you know, some of the things that, that Brown has said, specifically about the artwork, um, you know, in response books. On the, on the other side of the fence, though, is I look at those responses and, what they do say, what they do address, is addressed well, but they don't address everything. Um, and, and that sort of leaves the reader, you know, who wants to follow up and investigate, you know, on, on Brown's novel, it leaves, you know, the, these gaps and the, these questions. I, I sort of, you know, myself, uh, let's just take The Last Supper. I mean, I realize that, yes, there's a, there's a copy of The Last Supper where the names of the disciples are written there, and, yes, John is consistently portrayed as, as feminine by uh, Leonardo and other other artists, because he was thought to be a youth, you know, someone who had not yet become a man, so he's betrayed, for lack of a better word, effeminately. But on the other hand, if you look, if you do look at the figure to Jesus right in the painting, there is some ambiguity there because the figure is wearing a necklace. Now, you can find lots of pictures of John portrayed as feminine, uh, and even you know Brown would would of course, admit that. It's pretty mm -hmm. obvious. But then, you know, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see an art historian go through and say, well, how many times is, you know, John, you know, how many times does he have a necklace on? And that kind of thing. But to me, all of this introduces what I call the big so what question. And that is, let's just assume that Leonardo believed all this. Uh, I, I don't think he did, but let's just assume that, that he believed everything that Brown is articulating in the novel. The big so what question is, so what? So Leonardo believed it. To go from what Leonardo believed 
backward 14 centuries and saying that this was authentic Christianity is, to put it mildly, a quantum leap. I mean, you, you have to establish uh, historically, you know, that, that this not only is transmitted, even if it is transmitted, but that this was the uh, original, you know, teaching. The, the, this was the original you know, Christianity. And that's, that's what really, where the whole thing really falls apart. It's not so much Leonardo. Uh, Leonardo was brilliant, but brilliant people believe lots of strange things today that you and I would look at and go, well, that guy's really smart, but boy, I don't know where he's getting that. <laughs> so does that mean that, that it's something that everyone either should believe or did believe or does believe? Well, of course not. These are, these are just logical, um, barriers, you know, to, you know, embracing the entire thesis of, of what the Da Vinci Code is saying. And, of course, part of Brown's theory was the so-called shocking historical secret that has been guarded since, uh, what, the year 1099 by a secret European society. Others say, though, that this society was never formed until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, you know, you've, you, you've got a 900-year gap. Who's right there? Well, yeah, I, I think the question could be framed a little differently. Does Dan Brown have to cover 2,000 years or, or 1,000 years? Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, has to, he has to establish actual data for this. And in my view, that, that's what's lacking. I mean, I can, it would be kind of interesting, you know, if Leonardo you know, did believe these things and, and, and passed these things on. Um, I think there's good evidence that he was in the churches, the official churches, good graces when he... Uh, when he died, that he wanted to be either restored or or, or viewed as a as a faithful adherent. That that's quite inconsistent with what you know Brown is saying. But even if Leonardo was kind of doing the last hoodwink, you know, on the church, uh, you still have to establish data points for either a, a 1,000 or a 1,500 year period or a 2,000 year period. And the weakness of of the thesis of the Da Vinci Code is the actual data points. Well, and you just brought up something, Mike, that is very poignant here, and that is, what if Leonardo was merely throwing these codes in all his works just for fun, right? Yeah, yeah. He, you know, you could see that it would be consistent with his personality to, you know, to, to do things on the inside like this. I, I know he was a bizarre person. I'm told. Well, there. Yeah, I mean, I've read that. I've, that's one of the areas of controversy. How you know how bizarre is bizarre, and let's define. Uh, bizarre. He, I, I think a better word would be eccentric. I don't think anybody would disagree with that one because uh, it doesn't have the the negative connotation. But certainly, lots of you know people who are brilliant like that are are quite eccentric. Sure. Uh, the fact, though, as you point out, regardless of what Leonardo da Vinci knew or did not know, a couple thousand years ago was a very provocative period on this planet and to me that's the most important thing what happened then is probably the effort of all of us including you of course who has devoted his career to trying to find out just what happened and what's the significance of all of this yeah that, that's that's well put um i think it, it's really our job and some of us you know in, in my case i this is my vocation but I think, you know, it's all of our job to try to do that. We're all responsible for the same data, the same stuff uh, that's out there that, that has been recovered and restored and whatnot. And so when I look at something like the Da Vinci Code, and since the Da Vinci Code jumps into the source material, my first inclination is, okay, how does it handle the source material? We all have to handle it because that's all we have. So what... Does it do a good job of that? Of that? Does it do a so-so job? Does it do a great job, bad job, whatever? But we all have to work with the same material, and so that's how I think the, the overall thesis should be judged, not what Leonardo may or may not have believed. To me, that's peripheral. What, what's more important is what do we have from back then as, as far as we can, we can go back, and what does it tell us? What does it say? You know, there, there's also a furor, Michael, about Gnostic versus uh, divination and really now for our purposes what's the big difference there why is why is this matter as far as the gnostic worldview or yes yes <clears throat> well i think we're seeing a, a sort of revival 
uh, of the old Gnostic worldview. And, you know, there's the innocuous Gnostic worldview that, we're, that people, you know, would commonly associate, we'll, we'll say, with, for lack of a better term again, the New Age uh, movement or the New Age approach, New Age worldview. And that is that, you know, we're here on the, on the planet and, uh, you know, salvation to, to us, to a, a quote-unquote modern Gnostic, is the pursuit of, of knowledge. That's where the word gnosis comes from. And specifically knowledge about what? Well, about, I don't want to sound like Shirley MacLaine here, but, you know, just generally speaking, that humanity is divine. You know, that, that's the goal of the modern Gnostic, to, to uncover this, this reality, this, this teaching, this truth. And this is what the whole system revolves around. And that we can look at and say, well, you know, we can either agree with it or disagree with it. And we can say, well, that, you know, not, nobody's hurt by that. Nobody's, you know, sh you know, necessarily offended by that and so on and so forth. But if you're, if you're talking about full-blown Gnosticism, the way it's articulated in the Nag Hammadi text, that is more of what I would call a frontal assault on traditional Christianity. Because you have things that are just diametrically opposed to traditional Christianity. For instance, the God of the Old Testament in Gnosticism is actually evil. Uh, he is called the, the Demiurge, the Maker. And he is not a good guy. In fact, he, he is all about keeping humanity uh, enslaved and not letting humanity know its true origin. Jesus is not a redeemer. He, there is no such thing as atonement. Uh, the, you know, the death of Christ would have just been a, a meaningless act of violence as far as, you know, salvation goes. Um, you know, the serpent in Genesis 3 is the hero in Gnosticism because he's the first one who tells Adam and Eve that, hey, look, if you eat of this tree, the fruit of this tree, you're going to get Gnosis. You're going to be enlightened. Uh, and and the, the maker doesn't want that. So everything is sort of inverted in, in what we would call classical Gnosticism. And so if you're talking about that, that the church, the traditional church, would respond to more vociferously than somebody who's just, you know, generalizing, you know, I'm, I'm pursuing enlightenment kind of thing. In your opinion, what, what do you think came first, or was it coming at the same time? And that was the teachings of Gnosticism uh, to the people of that era, or to try to teach them that, you know, this was indeed some kind of heavenly event here. These are heavenly uh, episodes in your well, life. To, to a Gnostic, I mean, this is, one, this is one of the things that I think Dan Brown does, does most poorly in the novel, because even the Gnostic texts have Jesus as more than a man. I mean, for those who have read the Da Vinci Code, you know, there's this big scene in there where the, the grail expert, Lay Teabing, is saying, going on about how Jesus is just an ordinary man, and this idea that Jesus was divine is, was invented by Constantine. I mean, even the Gnostic texts don't believe that. Uh, to a Gnostic, Jesus was, was a, a heavenly being sent from, you know, the, the true God to earth. I mean, he was more than a man. He had flesh and he had blood, but, but that didn't make him human to a Gnostic. Now, it's not the same as in the traditional view that uh, the traditional Christianity has Jesus as being, you know, God, uh, Yahweh incarnate, born of a woman in the same essence as the Father. That's not what the Gnostics are saying, but what they are saying is that this is more than just an ordinary man. So both systems would have him as a, you know, a, a heavenly being. Um, you know, that, so that, that, there's, if you want to call it, some commonality. Um, Mike, Mike are, are our foundations shattered if... And how do I put this? Because here we are, you know, this is no coincidence that you're on right after Christmas, by the way. Are the foundations shattered if we find out one way or another just who this individual Jesus was, what kind of supernatural powers he may or may not have had, if for some reason we ever find this out? Well, somebody's going to go home disappointed, <laughs> uh, you know, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be a win-win situation because the systems are, are so oppositional. You, you asked a moment ago about which came first. Well, Gnosticism was a Christian sect. Um, the, in, in terms of the actual manuscripts uh, from, from Nag Hammadi, they're written in Coptic, which is an, a, a, a Grecianized form of the Egyptian language that was you know, post-Alexander, obviously, because Alexander Hellenized the whole world. Um, 
they're written in Coptic, and those the, the actual manuscripts date to around the 4th century. That's the 300s A.D., so that's considerably older than the New Testament. But the Coptic manuscripts are themselves translations of older Greek originals. And here's where, where you know you have to do some digging here, or you know have this as your field. Mm-hmm. The oldest material that anybody has for a Greek original for a Gnostic text, and I want to I want to be clear here. Everything that, that we have that we know of as the Nag Hammadi Gospels is in Coptic. It's not Greek, with one exception. The Gospel of Thomas, there are three fragments in Greek, and you know, there's a few words here or there. And those date to you know, roughly mid-2nd century. Mid to late 2nd century is the consensus view. Now, we know that the New Testament came earlier than that for two reasons. One, there are papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament that are older than that. And two, the early church fathers who were around when Gnosticism was forming and, you know, when the early church was, you know, getting its legs as well, they quote from the New Testament and the, the, the days, the years of their lifetimes are earlier than those Greek fragments for Thomas. So what we would call traditional Christianity, the traditional canonical texts of the New Testament, those were around a little bit before the Gnostic material, you know, anywhere you know, from 50 to 100 years, you know, which, you know, in, in manuscript study isn't a whole lot. But in your lifetime, I mean, that's, that's going to be a lot. You know, oh, my lifetime, 50, 100 years, lifetime. I mean, that's pretty, that's that's pretty it. much it. So, you know, you, you have to put it into a little bit of perspective. So if it's just a chicken or the egg kind of thing, and it's, you know, it's obviously more complicated than that, but if you're just going by dating, the traditional texts are going to have the edge. I was watching the History Channel today, one of their programs on UFO files, and they were theorizing that uh, we had been visited uh, during the ancient era and that the people of the time believed that these visitors were indeed gods. Now, what would happen, Michael, to our belief system if everything that we're talking about tonight was thrown out And not that you have the divination group and the Gnostic group, but that the gods were truly extraterrestrial. Then where are we? You know, my my answer is is a bit the same, but I'll add one thought. The the, the same part is that somebody's going to go home disappointed. (laughs) The the added thought is that, uh, I don't try try to use use the right word here. I guess I'll use the word shake up or disturb. I don't think it would necessarily overturn. Crush. But that would, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'd even use that. The, the, the real big problem, if everything is, you know, quote unquote extraterrestrial, and it is, is the issue of, okay, then what about creation? Because you still need a creator separate from the creation. And if that goes away, that is, that is even a bigger paradigm shift than, than all of the other stuff that falls under that umbrella. Let's pick that up when we come right back. We'll talk about the Creator, Michael, as we get into this. I'm George Norrie, back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie, Mike Heiser, our guest. Later on, we'll open up the phone lines, give you a chance to talk with him as well. Michael, we were talking about the Creator, and you are indeed correct. Eventually, you've got to get back to the one, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would tend to think that the, the Gnostic worldview could accommodate the idea that, you know, let's just say the supernatural figures in the Bible, you know, were extraterrestrial. Um, you know, I, I think Gnosticism would have, you know, some trouble, you know, just calling the the creator, uh, the in, in their view, the evil god of the Old Testament, an extraterrestrial. But, you know, you could you could sort of fill in the other gaps. I mean, the reason I say that is because Gnosticism... Uh, has God sort of as a as a force? The, the, the ultimate God, the real God, is an impersonal, far removed, transcendent being, and He created other gods sort of out of Himself. So that all the other divine beings are essentially pieces of Him, they, and they are all created beings. Now, uh, if you wanted to call them extraterrestrials, I think Gnosticism could adjust. It, it would. It would be a little painful, but it could do it. Traditional Christianity, on the other hand, since it views Jesus as part of the essence of, of the true God, but uncreated, it would it would be something that really it, it could not accommodate on that level. 
So there, there, that's, and that's just one example, but it really has to do with the difference between the two when it comes to, you know, an understanding of a Godhead or a God who creates all the other ones, that sort of thing. Do most people agree, whether they believe in the theory of uh, Gnosticism or divination or extraterrestrials, do they all generally agree that an individual walked this planet a couple thousand years ago and his name was Jesus? Most of them do. You have in what, I, what I'm calling the revisionist Jesus um, you know, really in the last five or ten years, you know, you, you have a revival of old, you know, the, you have the Gnostic Jesus, uh, and, but, but they recognize that, yeah, there was this person called Jesus, and they, they do view him as a divine being, and so on and so forth, but he was real. He did die, he did rise again. It's another thing that Brown, I think, drops the ball on in the Da Vinci Code, because uh, even the Gnostics, you know, their, their own scriptures you know, say that. Um, the ones that don't, are, I don't know if you've ever had them on Coast to Coast, but there were two authors, Timothy Freak, and then the guys, the other guy's last name is Gandhi. Um, they did a book basically saying that Christianity was a complete invention and is nothing more than warmed over uh, pagan religion, specifically from Egypt, Isis and Osiris religion, and that the, the character we think of as the historical Jesus is a fiction. But that's kind of unusual to go to that extreme, but they're, they're out there. Okay, let's let's make some assumptions for a moment, Mike, and then we'll look at it in, in different perspectives. The Da Vinci Code claims Jesus, Mary Magdalene, got married, had a child. Mm -hmm. If that is true, does that shatter everything from Christianity? Well, I, I don't I don't think so because even in the traditional view, it, it doesn't really. There's nothing. There's nothing that says Jesus couldn't be married. And there's nothing that says that he was. Again, even Gnostic texts, um, there's this word that you know shows up in the Da Vinci Code where, where Mary is called the companion of the Savior. It's the, it's the Greek word koinonos. Uh, but there's no Gnostic text that actually says they were married. It just calls Mary his companion. Then you have to say, well, what does companion mean? Um, you know, there, were, there would be those who would say, well, the word can mean wife or spouse, um, I have some things on my website from lexicons that basically say, well, yeah, I guess you could call a wife or a spouse your companion, but in the ancient literature, you're not going to find any uses of koinonos used that way. But, yeah, I, I guess it could be, but it would be nice to at least have one. Um, you know, but all that aside, I don't think it really makes any difference. Jesus was, in traditional Christianity, he was God in human flesh, but he was also a man. He had to grow up. He had to learn how to eat with a spoon. You know, they, Mary had to change his diapers. You know, I mean, he, yeah. he's, he's human, okay? And so there's nothing to prevent him, you know, from being married and fathering children. I, I sort of look at it, though, as, as a wise thing that, that he didn't. Um, again, because I don't see any evidence for it, because I think the, the reaction to the Da Vinci Code is, is evidence of the wisdom of not having Jesus do that, and that is this whole idea of that, well, there's this divine seed now, and these people are just a little superior to the other ones over here, or the rest of us. And I think that would have been, you know, not a necessary, but a dangerous thing to, to have this idea start that, that well, in the spectrum of humanity, there there is this, for lack of a better term, racial division. I mean, there are the the haves and the have-nots. There are the elite and the non-elites, and that's quite contrary to you know lots of things in, in, in the biblical text. So I think that's probably you know the hindsight view of why Jesus didn't get married. But theologically, there's no problem with it. Uh, and there are some Mike who believe that if that indeed occurred. And they had a child, and that seed went on, and then created this super race of of special people. Uh, a lot of people have assumed that that's how you know royalty started, maybe in England. Uh, that is part of how the Illuminati began. And yeah, to me, that doesn't sound like we're talking about a group of nice people the way they present it. No, and, and I, I would agree with you, I, and I, I think that's the danger. And again, I think that, you know, looking back providentially, uh, that that's why, you know, Jesus didn't get married, because the, the, the very human propensity would be to glorify and, and uh, elevate, you know, this particular line. I mean, that even happened, what you described, this whole divine right. I mean, even without there being any evidence that Jesus was actually married and fathered children, 
That thinking, though, has been around since antiquity, the divine right of kings. It's that thing we all learned about in history of Civ that just bored us to tears, but here we are talking about it on Coast to Coast. I mean, it, it, there was just this idea of an elite uh, bloodline, um, you know, that, that just they have the divine right to rule because the gods put them there, and you're the slaves and they're the rulers and just deal with it. Uh, that kind of thing. Whereas in, it, it's interesting in the biblical text in the Old Testament, you know, way back in Genesis 1, this links to my view of, of the image, what the image of God means. That is, the entire, everybody in the human race, every human being was created as God's imager. In other words, there is no elite and non-elite. Every human being has the same dignity and the same role, the same status of representing God on earth. It's not just an elect line. You know, it, the, the, new, the Old Testament democratizes the concept of God's representative rulers on earth. It, it's, it's everybody. It's humanity. It's not just one little strain of humanity. What if, and is it possible, Mike, that everything that we've read about in the past, that none of it's true, that there's, there's some other story <laughs> some other. <laughs> behind it? Maybe? George, you have a wonderful imagination. <laughs> I do. I do, since I was a kid. Uh, that's a great question. Um, boy, you know, how do you, how do you assess a question like that? Because for us to know that, you know, it, it puts us in a quandary of how do we know something without data, and if there was data, well, we'd probably know it already anyway. Um, you know, so how, do you, how would we even discern that? I guess we couldn't. We have to hold it out as, as some sort of possibility for which there is no data, but... You know, okay, well, I'm going to have, have to do come this along way. to do that. Here's, a, here's something that keeps coming up from people. They, they, they send me fast blast messages. I get emails. I want you to put it into this perspective because I can't answer this question, not, not the way you're going to. When we talk about the Bible, and to me one of the most important things in the Bible, in, I'm talking about the Old Testament now, mm -hmm. is you know when you talk about these fallen angels because what the heck are they? And then you talk about the book of Revelation. I mean, the beginning and the end of that book could be one of the most historical and important books of all mankind. My question to you, though, is, is over the period of the ages, how did that specific book get carried on down? At, at what point, for example, I mean, was, was the Bible there in the year 200? Was it there in the year 400? How was that carried on to where we have it now? Well, you, we've got the King James Version. You've got the Colburn Version. You've got all kinds of different mm -hmm. kinds of versions. Well, the oldest material that you have, let's just, let's just take it testament by testament. The oldest material we have for the Old Testament, of course, comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, but that was found when? In the 19... In the late 1940s. 40s, okay. Right. We had the Bible before that, didn't we? Yes, we did. Uh, we, you know, we've had we've had this thing called the Bible, um, you know, for for quite some time. Um, the, the problem was when we let, let's let's say imagine yourself back before 1947. You know, there were there are no Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, what you have is you have a Bible. You got two testaments. The oldest manuscript testimony to that Old Testament, that Old Testament part of your, of your Bible, was dated at 1008 A.D., which is like 3,000 years removed. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, just a long, long, long time. But that was all that was around. And literally overnight, this is one of the reasons why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important, literally overnight you jump back 1300 years into the era, you know, we'll say 300 BC, into the era when the Old Testament was was being was going through its final editing, and we know that editing was taking place because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You, there are examples of Old Testament books there in process. Right. Okay, and so that tells you though that prior to 300 BC, the actual material was around. We know from you know, the, the historical parts of the Old Testament that when they were in Babylon in exile, where everybody agrees the editing was done, that they already had copies of the Old Testament there. 
so now you're back in the sixth century BC. Uh, you, 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 you can, you can work your way back, you know, little by little by little by little, you know, to, to getting it, you know, a thousand or so years removed from the Dead Sea Scroll era. But, but the modern person in the 20th century didn't have, you know, any, the benefit really of that knowledge. We had, you know, some, some manuscripts that would go back to the New Testament era in, in Greek, the Old Testament in Greek, known as the Septuagint, but there was nothing that was, you know, as, as old as the scrolls are. So, yeah, it's been around, but the oldest stuff that we have that witnesses to it is about 300 B.C. For the New Testament, you get, uh, again... I mean, do we have hard evidence of something oh, yeah, from that can, era? Okay. Sure, you, you, can, you, go, you go and you, you can go to museums and look at the manuscripts and, you know, the originals or facsimiles, but, you know, if you really... You know, if you're really insistent, if you're important enough, I guess, they'll say, yeah, you know, here, here's, the, here's the drawer. I mean, here's where the originals yeah, come, are. Come on in and take a look at yeah, it. Yeah, come on in and take a look, but don't touch. You know, we'll have to have you arrested. <laughs> okay, I mean, so, that, so that basically what you're saying is, is those writings are backed up in what was subsequently found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, yeah, as far as the Old Testament. Okay. Right. I mean, the, the, the stuff is real. The, the real stuff dates to about 300 B.C. But again, the, the contents, unless you... See, here's the problem. You know, people would say, well, how do I know that the contents are right that tell us that they were working on this 200 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, you know, you, you have to do one of two things. Either you're going to give an ancient scribe the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't a moron or that he mm -hmm. wasn't just making it up. And, and all that sort of thing. And, and we, we give the scribes of Egypt this credit. We give the scribes of Mesopotamia this credit, Sumeria. That, that what they were writing is what they really believed. Okay? Whether we believe it or not is a different story, but what they were writing was, was real to them, and they actually wrote it down. We have the, the, the material. Unless you're a total skeptic that I'm not going to believe anything that anybody older than my own lifetime wrote, okay, then you need to approach all of it on an equal footing. You need to be fair to the material, whether it's biblical or non-biblical stuff. You need to approach it the same way and not be biased against one one pile or another. You know, unless you're willing to, to you know, to do that, then you're really saying, I, I can't believe in anything that I can't see or touch. Well, you know, what do you know about George Washington? Well, guess what? It's something that was written down. How do you know that that guy, you know, who wrote this down or, you know, any of these familiar historical figures in our own history. We're dependent on written documents. Well, you know, you talk about the Sumerians. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin was on uh, last week with uh, Hilly Rose for an hour. We've talked about Zechariah before, Mike. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know un unfortunately, uh, he, was, he was more interested in talking about his many books than the material that he had investigated, mm -hmm. which, which I, I consider to be earth-shattering if it's true and if it's accurate. But all, be that as it may, do you believe the Sumerians actually believed that we were visited from beings from this other planet called Nibiru? No, I don't, because in their own text, you'll never see Nibiru referred to as a planet beyond Pluto. Nibiru is identified with Jupiter and Mercury, and in one other text, it's also called a star. And I don't necessarily think that those are contradictory. I mean, there is a way that you can harmonize that. But what you can't do is you can't you can't say that they believe that it, that this thing called Nibiru was a planet beyond Pluto. Nibiru also showed up every year. It, it shows up in the uh, in Mesopotamian cuneiform astrolabes. It was a sign in the sky that appeared after the New Year's event, and, and that text alone. It's the Mole Apin text. People can go to my website and. And check this out. I mean, is there anything in in the Sumerian texts that talk about a planet that comes around every thirty six hundred no, years? No, because Nibiru well, is well, there every year. I mean, you well, you you caught the connection immediately there with that question. Yes, the, the actual astronomical text that you get from, you know, the the cuneiform tablets. I mean, there they know what Nibiru is. They they spot it. They write about it. So on and so forth. But you, you can't find a text that says this thing goes through you know our solar system every thirty six hundred years. This is why. Um, you know, I've, I've had on my website, it, it was Art Bell's idea that never went anywhere. One of Art's few ideas that never went anywhere <laughs> was, was, you know, to, you know, to have a show where, where I would debate Sitchin. And so I, what I did was, well, you know, here's a list of things I want to know on my website. And one of them is, can you show me a tablet? And, and even like one line of a tablet 
that has Nibiru, you know, going, you know, through the 3,600 years and, and all this stuff. Can you show me a text that, that has the Anunnaki and Nibiru associated in any way? What about and, that tablet? What about that tablet that shows all those planetary objects that seem to be more than what we know about? Well, you're, you're referring to a cylinder seal. The cylinder yes. seal is VA-243 in the Berlin Museum. You're, now, there's, there's two ways to look at the seal. One is as an astronomer, and that rules me out automatically. The other one is as a text person, okay, which I can, I can qualify for. On my website that's devoted to you know, the Sitchin subject material, <clears throat> that symbol, the circle with the, the points on it, that we associate with the sun yes. is actually not the sun because the sun iconography of Sumeria did not look like that. It was a circle with wavy lines going out. And I have pictures on my, on my website of the sun next to that symbol and other symbols where the, the Sumerians were, were distinguishing that symbol from the sun. So, and, and, you know, there's, there's three or four different problems with it, but one of it is this, this isn't the sun, and, and, and if it's not the sun, then the whole construct around which, you know, the, the whole construct that's erected around this assumption falls. And again, you, you know, your listeners can go up to the uh, to the site and, and, and see that. But what there's just a lot of things wrong with with the cylinder seal itself. The writing on it doesn't say anything about, you know, what the image is. It's really a boring inscription. You know, some guy to his servant. Was, do you think this was a blatant misinterpretation? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think that. I, I just don't think that. Uh, I don't think Sitchin checked out the iconography. I don't think there's anything sinister about it. Um, you know, some people want to say that, but I don't. I don't have any reason, you know, to to think that. All right, stay with us, Mike. I want to talk a little bit about uh, visitation and get your thoughts on that, and then we'll get more into the uh, Da Vinci Code. I'm Mike Kaiser. Maybe uh, Zechariah Sitchin has a piece of the puzzle. Maybe everyone has pieces of the puzzle, and they're slowly trying to put together the puzzle so we can all take a look at it. Um, he's got some theories, I think, that are obviously very thought-provoking, but maybe he just misses the mark. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> I mean, thought-provoking is, is the right way to, to characterize it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to create the impression that I've read, you know, everything that Sitchin has written. I've read uh, Twelfth Planet, uh, some parts of The Stairway to Heaven, and, and a few other things. Mm -hmm. I, I can say what I've read. I, I just don't, I don't see much validity uh, in, in what I've read in those books to this point. And, you know, I, I get asked a lot about uh, him, but you know, to be really honest with you, and I don't, I don't want this to, I don't, this isn't put in a negative way, but I have a lot of other things to think about, <laughs> you know, than, than Zechariah Sitchin. But I, I, I love the topic; it, it's a fascinating topic. You but know, a lot of people ask you about him. Why is that? Well, it's because I, it's because I'm. My field of Semitic languages. Okay. You know, so it, it's kind of That's a natural true. thing, you know, and it, it, it comes up in, uh, every now and then. By the way, I, I emailed you. I, I don't want to frighten your audience that I've moved into the 21st century, but I, I emailed you uh, the two files I was referring to before the break. This is the first show I've done on Coast to Coast where I have Internet access while I'm on the phone. Oh, my. We've it's, made a monster. Yeah, we've we made a monster. <laughs> Okay, I'll make sure that uh, during one of the breaks, I'll take a look at it. What is it, though, Mike, about spirituality? What is it about religion that is so important to everybody? Right. Because, I mean, wars are fought over this, Mike. People kill themselves sure. over this sure. stuff. Why? Why is it so important? Well, I think I think it's a I think there's a twofold way to approach that. To the average person, it's important because, and I would say to the modern person, you know give or take some extreme examples, uh, I think it's important because everybody wants answers to the big questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are we here? What's the whole purpose of this? Do I have uh, an ind individual destiny? Um, is, does my life have any sort of cosmic significance or not? Uh, you know, how, if there's an afterlife, and I think a lot, most people are persuaded that there is, what is it like? How do I get there? I mean, these are, these are major you know, major questions that everybody has, has had, you know, for a long, long time. 
But on the other hand, you have people who I think, you know, quite frankly, and whether they whether they pretend to be Christian or they pretend to be Jewish or Muslim or you know whatever it is, that they will capitalize for their own selfish gain on people's need, you know, to get questions like this answered or to have coherent mm-hmm. answers, and they'll use that to to manipulate the masses and and to achieve their own selfish ends. And if that means killing other people to do it, then that's what's going to happen. You know, so I I don't I don't think people. Are, are into the game, as it were, if I can use that expression. I don't think people are into the game for the same reason. I think, you know, the fundamental reasons are the ones I just outlined. But then you just have people that, that I'm here to just use other people, and religion is a convenient tool that I can use, and I'm going to go ahead and do it. Absolutely, to, to get them, uh, up, uh, to uprise them, to make money, to do whatever you have yep. to do. Yep. You know, Mike, when I was in my 20s, you know, I didn't pay that much attention to this. And then in the 30s, I started thinking about it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. 40s, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Now I'm, I'm in my 50s, and it's not quite an obsession, but the push to find this answer, because I now feel like I'm working against the clock. Mm-hmm. And it, it is important to me as a human being to begin to get some of the answers to some of these questions that we all have. And, and I'm convinced that there is an afterlife. I, I, I truly believe it. I'm convinced I I, that, 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 there, I, that there is life out there on other planets. I think there's other universes. And I think now I'm getting to a point where I think all of this somehow is tied together. Now, whether a person by the name of Jesus who lived on this planet a couple thousand years ago understood this or knew this, I don't know. But I think he did somehow. What what sets traditional Christianity apart? This is just sort of a general observation. What sets traditional Christianity apart, as far as you know, approaches to religion, is that all, all religions have this this sense that okay, here we are in this world, and we need to get to the next. And there's an obstacle, and usually the obstacle is either human imperfection or human sin, or some combination thereof, that there's this sense we all have, you know, like, boy, this is profound, that we're not perfect, and that we do, you know, wrong things. If there's a God that, you know, at some point in our life we've done something to offend God, and and we need to get back in his good graces, you know, they're all sort of, you know, dancing around, you know, those those kind of points. And what, what makes Christianity unique is that the solution to that problem is not the chief deity, God, looking at the human being, Mike or George, and saying, you need to buck up, fella, or you're toast, you know, when it comes yeah. to, to the time that, 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 that you die. Christianity turns that, inverts it, and says, look, I know you're in trouble, Mike or George, and my solution to this is that I'm going to send my son to be punished in your place. And if you just believe that, that's fine with me. So in other words, God takes the responsibility on himself. He doesn't place it on the person to just, you know, run, run, you know, run the mill, you know, the, the wheel, like we think of the, the rat on the wheel, to try to, you know, do all they can to e- sort of erase their imperfections or, or do away with, you know, the, the, the concept, whatever the concept of sin is. But Christianity sort of inverts it and says, I will pay the price for you if you believe this, then I'm going to apply it to your account, to your case. And that, I think, is something that we all need to think about because I, I do think that, that religions basically address all the same questions, but I think there's a sense of futility if, if I'm responsible completely because, you know, frankly, George, between you, me, and as Richard Hoagland would say, the 15 million people listening, <laughs> I'm just not good enough. Okay, I'm, I'm not going oh, wouldn't, to be I able to bridge this that. gap. And I'm going to need what we call in theology the grace of God. You know, applied to my account, and if if God says you don't need to jump through the hoop, you know Jesus jumped through the hoop. You just have to believe that He did, and this is sufficient. That has a certain appeal, and and if you take a look at the New Testament, that that is the gospel in, in New Testament terms. And I would agree with you completely that that teaching has been perverted. It's been used to manipulate people. It's been distorted. Uh, all of this is. You know, we have history. That's what history shows. So I, I always encourage people, look, 
I'm not going to tell you not to go to church. I'm not going to tell you not to go to mass or go to synagogue or anything like this. What I think you should do is just go look in the text. When I was a kid, Mike, raised a Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, I was always told, you have to confess your sins, you know, in a confessional booth before a priest. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have a venial sin, okay, not all that bad. If you have a mortal sin, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And then I had my buddies who were Protestants and Baptists and everything else. And I said, hey, so what would you tell the priest? And they said, what are you talking about? We don't, we don't do that. We don't have to say that. Right. We don't, we don't do. right. and, and I started thinking to myself at the age of about 11 or 12 years old, you know, how come I'm going to go to hell if I don't tell this priest these things that I may have done? And and my buddy here doesn't have to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And the door is open to him. I started trying to figure out there's something wrong here in this mm -hmm. picture. Yeah, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, we could we could talk about why the Catholic Church has, you know, conf confession and I, I'm not I don't view it as negatively as, as some other people you know, who are not Catholic would. I'm, I'm not Catholic. But I think the more fundamental answer is that regardless of how your buddies treated it, what again, what you need to do, if, if you, you, you snoop around the New Testament long enough, you're going to hear Jesus say things like, you need to confess your sin to the Father. I mean, you need to talk to God. You need to confess your sin and have faith in me and so on and so forth. Um, it's, a, it's a personal thing. It's a thing between you and God. Christ is the ultimate mediator in Christian theology, and that's what counts. You know, the, the other stuff, we can talk about why the other stuff is the way it is or isn't, but when you get, in, get your nose into the New Testament, like I said, you snoop around long enough and you figure out that, hey, you know, this is, this is a personal, individual thing, and God has set it up that way. And he's basically told everybody, anybody can get to me through Christ. And that, that's just it. Everything else is window dressing. <laughs> and so I, I encourage people, look, I know you're just, I have people, you, you talk about a really bizarre experience. I've, I've gone to UFO conferences and, and done whatever they asked me to do. And I have people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, are you a pastor? Can I go to your church? And I'm, really? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, wow, this is out of left field. <laughs> Oh, you're I mean, part of uh, Hoagland's God, Man, and E.T. series. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually... And, I, and you're in there, and I'm saying to myself, you know, there he is. Yeah, and but I have people actually at a UFO conference. They want to, you know, and I, you know I'm quick to say, well, I'm not a priest, but, but I mean, they almost approach me that way. And so I know from that, this, this is, by the way, one of the reasons I think ufology is important. And for all those scholars out there who might be listening to this show that just think this is a lot of hooey, I would suggest to you that UFO stuff is important. And a lot of the stuff that gets talked about on Coast to Coast is important because it all addresses the big questions. And if you want to cut people off from this, then you know that, that's your business, and frankly, I think that's your mistake. But it just tells me that people are, are thinking about all this. And I have people that... I say, look, I'm so discouraged with my church, you know, for this, that, or the other reason, and and I, I don't, I don't ever tell people to abandon, you know, their their faith or their church or whatever. What I tell them to do is, look, go back, you know, God gave you a brain, you got a good head on your shoulders, you can read, you know, you can email me, whatever, I'll help you do whatever you can, but go look for yourself. I mean, if if we really think that the Bible is what what we say it is, that it's God's word to humanity, well, you're in the human race, that means you're included. And so it's there for you. So you know, go and check it out. And I and I'll you know I'll try to you know lead people to different passages that I think might be helpful. But you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed at the questions I get. You know, at, at places like a UFO conference. So tell me, what does Michael Heiser believe? What do you think this is all about? <laughs> What's it all well, about, Alfie? <laughs> What's it all about, Alfie? I think it's about. Uh, I, I I do believe that that in God's eyes, every human being is his imager, that it was his original plan that, that every human being be with him, manage the cosmos with him. I'm, I'm, I'll try not to wax too poetic here, George. Uh, <laughs> that, that that was the original intent. I do think that, that there was an entrance of evil into the world. Humanity did fall. And instead of abandoning humanity, God said, okay, now we've got to have a plan. We've got to have a plan that both satisfies me because this is bad, sin is bad, I'm, I'm God, you're supposed to obey me, but also I love you, and I don't want you to fall by the wayside. And the plan that God came up with was, I'm going to 
redeem you myself. It's not up to you because you're frankly not going to do it well. You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. And so I'm going to take steps that, that you come back to me. And I, I look at the Old Testament as nothing more you know, than this war between good and evil. You know, We can talk about the sons of God. We can talk about the watchers. We can talk about who the enemy is. But fundamentally, it's God reclaiming humanity as his own family. That is it in a nutshell. And, and God's efforts to do that and, and the opposition that God has met and has had to deal with, both from people, their, their own you know, hearts, and also from outside forces. I think that's what it's about, reclaiming humanity as, as part of his family. I'm going to ask you this just because I want to frustrate you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I agree that we eventually get to a creator. I've always believed that. I, I, I don't know exactly what it is or how it's done, but I do believe there's a creator. We can, we can deal with it in spiritual terms, religious terms, whatever we want to do, but there's no question in my mind, and it's obvious in yours too, that there is a creator. The question, though, Mike, is what created the creator? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, that, that assumes that the question needs to be asked and answered. <laughs> <laughs> On this show, it has to be. Of course, well, of, of course, it's fair game. For this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, my view of creation is that you, you, must have a, you must have a first cause. And the first cause has, has to be independent of creation. What that means is that the first cause is either... A, uncreated, and that's the most coherent you know, option, or B, is of some other time of, of creation that doesn't fit in everything that was created. And that sounds so convoluted, which is why I say the first option is a lot easier to express. You have, you have something that brought everything else into existence. And that means that the something that did that was itself uncreated. Now, this isn't theology necessarily. This is Aristotelian logic. This is philosophy, and, and I don't think philosophy is a swear word. Some people who are into biblical study, oh, don't, you don't do philosophy. You've got to stick with the Bible. Well, you know, the early church fathers would have thought that was silly, and I would agree with them. I think you need, you know, you need to, to analyze what the text says as well, uh, you know, through, through logic and philosophical categories. And so I would say that there is this entity that was separate from creation, that brought everything else into existence, and he was not created. Uh, he is the first cause, so on and so forth. Everything extends from that. Even if you get the baby universe model, well, our universe was just burped into, into existence by another universe. Well, right. somebody had to, had, to, had to start that because you only got three options. Either everything is here, everything created itself, which is kind of a logical conundrum. Everything came from nothing or everything came from a creator some some sort of first cause now in my mind the third is the most coherent because the, the second one says everything here is here because of nothing that doesn't make any sense and the first one presupposes itself it's circular reasoning everything created itself well how did that start why is why was it here in the first place well, because it was here. I mean, it, you just you keep going in a circle. There, there's no there's no coherence to it. So that's why I fall into the third category of, of needing a first cause it's for philosophical reasons. Well, and, but why then was evil created? I mean, why did we need that? You know, if we got this great creator and and we have the ability to have this wonderful universe, I think why throw this into the mix? I think evil is the price that God had to pay for, for not making us robots. In other words, as soon as you decide to give your, cre your creatures, free your, will. your humans, free will, as soon as you make that decision, you know that they'll use it. And you're not always going to like the way they use it. But you deem that better than if they had no mind of their own. Because if they have no mind of their own, how can they choose you? How can they choose right? How can they love you? It, there, there, there's no freedom in it. And so I think evil is the, is the price that God had to pay. That's one of the best answers. Robots. One of the best answers I've heard on this so far. You know, theologians have gone, been going through this for years, and they can't come up with an answer, Mike. 
How did you get? I think it's pretty simple. I, I just I, I look at it. I look at something like that pretty simply. I'll admit it, but to me, it it, it makes sense. What sparked your interest in this entire field? Well, I had no um, I had no spiritual upbringing until um, I was a, a teenager. I was always interested in in uh, religious stuff. Mm-hmm. But I had no background. I had no, my, my parents, you know, never took me to church or anything like that. I was just, I was just kind of there. Um, I always liked paranormal stuff again because it's the big, big questions. You know, it was very appealing. And I, I, when I since I was a kid, I've always, you know, liked the, the kind of stuff that Coast to Coast, you know, does. Um, when I was 16, I, you know, sort of did what I encourage other people to do. I started looking at this thing that people talk about the Bible and just started reading it myself. I I had a friend encourage me to do that. And, you know, I just, I I don't know for lack of a better term, it just just clicked one day that who I was in relationship to God, uh, I wasn't a bad kid, but I know I wasn't the greatest kid. And I just felt that, you know, if there's a God, I I owe him something. Um, It makes sense to me that there would be a God and I don't want to be offensive to him. So what do I need to do? to, you know, sort of follow him, to follow that path. And then I started reading and I read about the Gospels and what what the New Testament says is is the good news, you know, that Christ died for us and so on and so forth. And that's how I, I was drawn into it. I just started reading. I just started thinking about it. Huh. I, didn't have, hey, I didn't have anybody throw it at me. Any significance to the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 47 and so was uh, the Roswell case? You know, you know, I have... I don't know. I have thought about that. Oh, you want to know something really? I don't know. If hold, time. hold it. Hold the thought. We'll, we'll come right back to that when we come back. I'll also uh, open up Fast Blasts, and we'll take some of your questions. I'm George Nori. Back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. How ironic, earlier today, while I was looking at Michael's website, uh, I didn't go to the Coast to Coast link, which goes straight to Michael Heiser's website, which is Michael S. Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R dot com. Instead, I just typed up michaelheiser.com. I didn't put the S in there. And uh, sadly, that website belongs to, in tribute to the memory of a Michael Heiser, Sergeant Michael Heiser, who died in the Middle East some time ago. Very, very strange uh, and uh, sad uh, stumbling into that website, to be sure. I'll be back in a moment. Mike Heiser, our guest, will take some fast blast questions, continue chatting with him about the tie-in between Roswell and the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were both uh, kind of discovered in 1947. And then next hour, your phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. <laughs> Okay, Mike Kaiser, you were saying Roswell, Dead Sea Scrolls, both in 1947. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's some really weird stuff uh, that's connected with that. It, for your listeners, your listeners are probably familiar with the work of David Flynn, uh, who yep. was part of the God, Man, and E.T. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the last uh, Ancient of Days conference uh, in, in Roswell, he came up with something that just kind of freaked me out. I mean, to be honest with you, he uh, he took the crash site and sort of mapped it out. He he's sort of known for you know mapping things out longitudinally with latitude and uh, mapped all of this out. And he was he was thinking about you know why what's so significant about 2012 and what's so significant about 1947 and so on and so forth and. You know, to make a long story short, people can go up to, to Dave's website and look at this. But in his, not just his, but you know, the, the system that was used throughout antiquity, uh, breaking the Earth into you know nautical miles and the, the circumference of a circle and whatnot, on on that date, December, I guess it is the 21st, 2012, whenever the Mayan calendar uh, ends, which you're going to have John Major Jenkins on uh, to talk about, that is the completion of a platonic year and it is also if you, if you take the numbers from that 2012 and you put them onto the heaven earth grid the uh, where that intersects with 33.33 it goes right through a place called Mount Hermon which is where the watchers descended in uh, the, the book of Enoch and the, ah. that version of the Genesis 6 story and on the other side of the world where the two points intersect is in Roswell, New Mexico. 
<laughs> it's just the weirdest thing, you know. And, I, I, and you know, Dave is just – I can remember sitting with my wife, the Ancient of Days thing, when he's going through this, and I looked at her and I said, nobody but, nobody but Flynn would think to ask these questions and just to come up with this. So, you know, that's kind of you know, humorous and, and sort of unusual. But what I, what I think, if there's any validity to that, I personally think – that there is sort of a, a spiritual, you know, religious connection here because one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, I haven't written too much on this, is that the worldview that's articulated by Gnosticism, just the way it, it, it constructs its cosmology, is very similar to, um, how can I put this, there's a lot that you could read in UFO literature uh, things from abductees or what we would call experiencers, there are a lot of things that they say that match Gnostic cosmology that also match hmm. um, sort of the dark side of, of what we think of in, 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 in UFO uh, circles. Right, it's, exactly. You know, it, it, and to me, it, I wonder... And there, there, there's been a few attempts, not by me, but by other people, to sort of match up the Gnostic gospel, the Gnostic cosmology, with with what's going on in in uh, this abduction worldview, for lack of a better term, that that gets thrown out there, the Genesis six kind of thing. That that this is what it's talking about. That we're not really dealing with extraterrestrials like we like to think of them. You know, these these passive beings, you know, that have mundane and corporeal existences on another planet, but we're dealing with a spiritual reality that is sort of masquerading itself as an extraterrestrial reality so that, that we, a modern 21st century society, will accept these beings as our gods. And it, it's a very you know, sinister thing. And so Flynn is going down this road, and I, I'm, I'm just looking at what he's doing, I'm looking at what other people are doing, and it just seems that this would be too coincidental to be just completely off the wall accidental that that there there there's there's something here to look at i'm i'm not saying i know exactly what it is yet here's the other weird thing that we're all familiar with september 11th now uh, oh, for yeah. obvious reasons it's I, in our minds forever i think right. like. when you talk about the the birth of christ though there's there's a book out and i didn't write it so i feel good about mentioning the title uh on on the star of bethlehem by ernest martin who was a historian, and he argues, and I read this book, and I'm usually not the product of the latest book I've read, but this is, it's so compelling with all the ancient material. He argues that the birth of Christ occurred on September 11th, 3 B.C. I mean, September 11th, it just jumped out at me. Huh. And what, what, part of what he does is he, is he takes the description of Revelation 12, where you have, you know, the, the sign, great sign in the heaven, there's a woman you know, clothed with the sun, there's a moon under her feet, on her head's a crown of 12 stars. He figures out when that would have occurred astronomically. You know, there, there's a lot more to it than that. And the only time that you get that description in the sky that matches up with what all, you know, all the major observatories think was the star of Bethlehem, this Jupiter Regulus, uh, you know, overlap. The only time that that happened, all those things happened simultaneously was September 11th and 3 BC. Oh, that's weird. And if yeah, I know, if, if you take weird. that date, it 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 satisfies, it solves a lot of other chronological problems that are associated with the time of Herod and the time of Christ. It, it, it's 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 very powerful. I, I should after the show, I'll, I'll have to put up a, a link on the website to the, that particular book, but. You know, you run into stuff like that, and and I just don't think it can all be coincidental. And it it's just so huge. You know, you get these correlations, and you know, I'll never run out of things to think about. You know, trust. Okay, me. and but you know, by the way, you you mentioned something about the, you can mention it because you didn't write the book, Mike. I I have no problems with you or anybody mentioning what you do. You you don't get paid being on the program, and you you deserve to tell people about some of your works. Yours, of course, the facade. Um, earlier, you know, I was mentioning uh, an, another guest. I mean, w when it's every three minutes, it, it gets to be too extreme. But you, <laughs> you are, you are wonderful. So don't ever feel as if you have to apologize. Well, thanks that. for that, George. Let's go to some fast blasts here. Um, 
Let us go to Daniel in Palo Alto, California. I want you to comment on Ezekiel's wheel. If you think it was ufology, or what do you think? I, I think that what Ezekiel saw was, well, if you go to Ezekiel 1, here's, here's sort of an indirect answer, but it has a point. If you go to Ezekiel 1, and if you'd make a list of the descriptions that he has there, the, the, the cherubim, the four faces, the wheels, the platform, all this kind of stuff, you can find every one of those things, every one of those components to the description in ancient sculpture of the day, Babylonian sculpture. That's where Ezekiel was. He was an exile in Babylon. And I have, again, some of this on my website, where what, what's being described is a typical throne, a royal throne, the throne of God, as it were, uh, in Ezekiel's vision, and what, what they look like. We essentially have the Polaroids, <laughs> the ancient Polaroids of Ezekiel's vision, and they're called sculptures from Babylon. And drawings, you know, and, and etchings, you know, not etchings, that, that would be a modern term, but, uh, in, inscriptional art, iconography, that sort of thing. So no, I don't think he saw a flying saucer because we know what he saw because they drew it. They built it. Uh, you can find all the elements right there, um, in that chapter. So I, I tend to think that there's not anything, I, mean, I, I hate to say Ezekiel 1's not spectacular, but you, you get the drift, that there's not anything, uh, in terms of a spaceship there, it certainly was spectacular, but you know we we have the iconography to match up with it, yet you do believe in extraterrestrial life, yeah, I think it's entirely possible and i don't, I don't have a theological problem with it either. I think it'd be kind of cool uh, so i'm I'm hoping that that someday you know the the only question in my mind is okay if if they're there like like where do we put them? you know how do we categorize them? I'm perfectly willing you know a lot of you know, people who would be you know Christians uh, in this field would say, well, if there's extraterrestrials out there, they must be demons, they must be evil. Well, you know, that, that is a possibility. I'm perfectly willing to think that, that you have God, you have angels, you have demons, and you have extraterrestrials. I mean, they're just, they're just another thing, sure. or another category. Messengers of deception, as Jacques Vallée would say? Yeah, I mean, you, it, what's really strange is that a lot of the work that has, been, that has propelled the Christian community to look at uh, UFO stuff in general very negatively it wasn't written by Christians. It was written by John Keel and Jacques Vallée. You know, some of these writers that have no particular religious axe to grind, and they're saying, you know, this, this just doesn't look good, folks. And so that's been around for 20 years, you know, 20, 30 years. And it's, I mean, it's quite persuasive, but I still consider it, you know, only a possibility. It's not the only possibility. Zot from Texas wanted you to know that in 1947, Aleister Crawley died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just going to tuck that away. Robert from Santa Monica, California, wants to get your reaction about the Pope's statement of a day or so ago about a new world order, and we need to work toward it. Hmm. Yeah, wouldn't we like to know what he meant by that? Um, They're all in on it, aren't they? Well, you know, I... To me, you know, let's talk about conspiracy for a moment. You know what a conspiracy is, George? A conspiracy is a bunch of people, either well, you know, a small or, or a big number of people. Could be two. Could be two. Who collude together to get what they want. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that, that's not terribly profound. I mean, this happens all the time. It happens in our homes. It happens with kids. It happens between spouses. It happens at work. It happens in church. I mean, people cooperate for their own self-interest and to think that oh well when people hold a certain government office they don't do that anymore it's just absurd so that's a long way of saying that I, I I'm what I would call a small c conspiracist in that conspiracies are just part of life they're just normal human behavior and I think they happen at, at the highest levels what I don't know but what I suspect people would like to do and, and, and are trying to do is that you have this grand, you know, historical conspiracy that has existed for centuries that is just moving along. And that, that may or may not be the case, but, you know, what I would need is just more, more data for that. But the idea that it could, you know, be something, an agenda could be being furthered, you know, being carried on, you know, from our ancestors and our ancestors before them. I don't think there's anything terribly profound about that or shocking. 
Here's an interesting question from Matt in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm going to paraphrase it because it's kind of lengthy here. But he goes on to ask you if you think there are any lost books written by Jesus, maybe books of the Bible. Now, isn't that interesting? Why didn't Jesus write? He just performed. Yeah, there, there's, yeah there's really nothing. There's really nothing in any any of the canonical or non-canonical material that, that credits Jesus with writing. I I think it's basically a, a style thing, and that, that might sound like a like a weird way to put it, but Jesus wasn't he wasn't an official rabbi. I mean, the rabbis of the day were always asking him, "Hey, by what authority do you do all this stuff, and do you say this?" You know, so people that think Jesus was like a rabbi, you know, that, that just doesn't measure up with the New Testament because the rabbis just didn't know why he was doing it. But he was a teacher. He gets called rabbi. It's a, it's a general name for, like, instructor. But he, did, he wasn't, you know, officially accepted by the rabbinical community. And, that, and their style was just to go around and, and teach, to talk. And I don't think, you know, he felt any, any inclination. He need to write. Yeah. I don't think any, and even his followers. I mean, for all, for all that we can tell, the story of Christ was transmitted orally at, at first. This would be the natural way of, of preserving things. And I think the, the apostles themselves, you know, sort of looked at each other one day and said, hey, we're getting old. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we better commit some of this to writing before we die or, it, it, you know, it's going to be lost. So I think they were driven by, by pragmatic considerations, you know, to, to get it written down. Do you believe the Shroud of Turin might be actually the uh, imprint of Jesus? For, for me, that would depend on... I know there, there's been a there's been at least one person on the team that, you know, the results were that it was a, a medieval relic, you know, the carbon-14 tests. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been at least one guy on that team that does not think that the carbon-14 results are valid because of the, the place where the sample was taken it was it was on a place where that, that was handled by human hands and so he believes it's a, a polluted sample it would depend on me as, as to whether what that guy is saying and, and he would know he was on the team so i think it should be retested uh if if it's retested and then it you know goes back into the first century yeah i, I would be inclined to say that i think it's authentic nick from minneapolis listening to us on kstp am wants to know if you think we're headed into end times oh boy you know specifically you know the, the short answer is i don't know um the long answer the long answer is that i think there isn't much in terms of the, of the way things are described in revelation i i can't see you know too much that would be very difficult to pull off given the state of our technology and the state of, of, of what the world is globally, this, this mindset, you know, again, to collude and have this new world order kind of thing. Uh, I think the stage could quite readily be set for that. But again, prophecy is a really a complicated thing. My, my own view of this, just in general terms, is that things are going to happen associated with the second coming the way they happen with the first. That is, there's going to be things that nobody had any idea that this was a prophecy, and yet it was. Uh, I, think, I think that the people, these people that, that go around saying, I've got the, the entire prophetic picture mapped out, and I know what's going to happen, I know what these passages all mean. Yeah, you know, I, I think the rabbis you know, thought that they had it down, too, as far as the, the first coming, and where were they surprised? Um, I think this, the same kind of thing is going to happen again. We we are just going to be taken quite by surprise because prophecy is not a simple thing. This idea that everything has to be fulfilled literally is not true even for the first uh, incarnation of Christ or other prophecy. There are five or six different ways things get fulfilled. And I think we're going to be taken quite by surprise. Do you believe the Antichrist is already here among us, Mike? I, I think he could be. I do believe in a literal... Uh, a literal antichrist, you know, that, that he will actually be a person. He's not a force or just the devil or something like that. Or, an, or a number. Or right, or a number or anything like that. I, I, I do think that uh, I, I went out on a short limb in, in my book, Islam and Armageddon. I, I personally think there is an Islamic connection to antichrist lore, um, and that's... It wasn't because of September 11th or anything like that. It actually has to do with, with the geography of certain prophecies 
uh, certain things happening in certain geographical locations that yes. today are, are, are Muslim territory. Well, they began there, and they'll probably end there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think that, that we should pay attention to some of the geography, and it, it's not very exciting or, or terribly spectacular, but I think it's important. You think we'll ever find the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> I used to tell people it was in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know the uh, valuable garage. Yeah, there you go. Um, I don't. That would depend on whether there is a need for. It's really two questions. Is there a need for the Ark in what the Bible describes as the the afterglow of Armageddon, you know, the, 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 the kingdom on earth. Is there a right. need for that particular artifact? And even if there is, that I don't think it precludes that another one could be made. In other words, I don't think we have to have the original. But since that's a possibility, I, I have to backtrack and say, yeah, you know, it is possible it could be found if there's a role for that. I'm not convinced that there is, but uh, if there is, then... Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. I do not think it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, I, I tell you what, I'd love to be able to find it with the Ten Commandments inside of it. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Stay with us. Mike Heiser, our guest. Phone calls next. Yours on Coast to Coast AM. All right, we're back with Mike Heiser here on Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Norrie. Michael, do you believe in angels? Yes, I do. Me too. You ever have any angelic things happen to you? No, I haven't, but, but my wife has a few good stories. <laughs> Saved by the angel? Well, just, you know, not, I wouldn't say a life or death dramatic, but she has a couple that are kind of interesting, you know, that sort of preventing a, an accident while she was, you know, driving down. And one of those were, you know, I don't know how I avoided hitting this or that and, I just felt like the car was, you know, moved over or something. You know, just unusual things like that. Now, again, nothing life or death, but you know, it could have been a an accident or that kind of thing. She's got one or two of those. It's all got to be connected somehow, isn't it? Well, I, you know, I think there's a, a spiritual world um, that interacts with us on a regular basis. I think that's just a part and parcel of of accepting a theistic uh, view of of the way things are. Oh, do you think that Jesus was able to tap into this then a couple thousand years ago? Did he really have the ability to, let's say, raise Lazarus from the dead? Was he a magician? How did he have these abilities? Well, I, I, I do think that he was uh, God in human form. Um, so half of the answer is, yeah, you know, he, he could do these kinds of things. But the New Testament's also clear that, that the incarnation, the process of him becoming human, also... Uh, led to certain limitations. Philippians 2 is the best passage for that if your listeners want to look it up. But, but it was a voluntary, voluntarily, you know, self-limiting sort of act that if, if I'm going to affect this plan for salvation, then the Son needs to become a man. And that's going to involve setting aside uh, certain attributes uh, for a time or until God, you know, wants certain things to be exercised. I mean, Jesus said on a couple of occasions where, you know, his first uh, miracle at Cana, you know, he, he says to his mother, you know, hey, my, my time hasn't yet come. You know, I'm not really quite sure if we should be doing this. Or, and he would do something and he would tell people, now, don't, don't say anything. So there was a certain timing aspect for him to be acting in, in what the, we theologically would call the God's will, you know, for, for his, his use of this power. So there were limitations, but yet the, the power was also there but under control. All right, let's go to the phones. We'll pick it up first of all, go, going to our wild card line. You're on Coast to Coast with Mike Heiser. Hi there. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, and Happy New Year. This is well, thank you. You Maui. too. Hello there. Yeah, fascinating uh, topic tonight, and I really enjoy your ministry, Mike. Um, <laughs> my question is, have you ever run into a gentleman by the name of... Uh, Ivan Panin, P-A-N-I-N, -N, he is in Peter. No, I haven't. Okay, he dates um, the, uh, what you call the triumphal entry of Jesus as the uh, fulfillment of the prophecy in uh, Daniel, mm -hmm. going from um, the 11th year of Zedekiah for Second Chronicles uh, chapter 36, 
verses 11 to 23, and it's a very late date, but it works mm-hmm. out so that uh, no uh, interpolation of prophetic years and all of that is required. Is, is he a preterist as well? Um, I believe so. Yeah, he's uh, he's probably listed on their on their archives. Then, you know, I, oh, I can good. go look him up. Good. Yeah, yeah, because uh, he's got a little book here, uh, his Bible chronology, uh, which was done back in uh, the early part of the uh, 20th century. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he worked for like 50 or 60 years. He started on, he did a lot of work in Bible numerics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and exhaustively recorded, this is on the aid of a computer, all the combinations of numbers validating the authenticity of Scripture, mm-hmm. which it would be humanly impossible for anybody to have... Mm improvised, you know, on their own, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, have it make sense and everything. And then when you couple that with uh, the stuff they're finding out today with the, uh, you know, the so-called Bible codes, uh, it it would just be absolutely impossible for any human to devise uh, scripture that um, would be able to incorporate these Bible codes and these Bible numerics that... uh, Pannon discovered uh, back in the latter part of the 19th century and spent his whole life investigating and compilating and uh, and also have a literal text that makes sense. Hmm. Well, well, it really establishes the extra human origin of Scripture. Well, I'll, I'll have to look him up. I mean, you're, the listeners will know that I'm, I'm not... Uh... I'm not positively disposed toward Bible codes, but I, I am interested in numerics. For instance, I, I do think that there is gematria-type interpretation going on in the book of Revelation. Um, so I'll also look him up. I might find some, some good stuff there. Thanks. Much like what Stan Tennant does. Mark, yeah, Stan, Stan sent me his uh, DVDs you know, after I was on with him the last time. I haven't, I haven't gotten to watch them yet, but yeah, it, it sounds... I'm sure there'd be some some sort of overlap there that I'm going to have to just learn about. Let's go to our west of the Rockies line. Welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hello, George. Seamus Hi, Seamus. Good to hear from you. How are you? I'm doing fine, sir, and a uh, very happy new year to you. Thank you. I have a quick question for Michael, and I'll listen to the answer off the air. You got that. Um, I was wondering, is there any historical evidence as to the activities of Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30? Depends what you mean by historical. Well, any, any indication of what he might have been up to? There's, there's nothing that comes from that actual period. There is anecdotal um, evidence. Now, wh- whether you want to call that historical or not, of course, is you know, open to debate. Um, most of that kind of thing really is, is quite a bit later. Um, and so, you know, scholars look at it and you know, I, I don't want to, you know, pick on the Book of Mormon, but that would be kind of an example. I, I don't mean it as a negative example either, but something that that is quite a bit chronologically removed that has, you know, this information for this time span. And so scholars tend to look at that and go, well, this is interesting, and boy, wouldn't it be great, you know, if we could really know this was valid or not. I wish there was a, a text that, that approximated the time of Christ, you know, that went, you know, filled in the time gap. So, you know, if you're talking contemporary, boy, you know, there there isn't much. Now, you have you have apocryphal gospels, that would be within a couple hundred years, um, but most of those are really sort of, uh, again, again, without without casting a negative pall on it, a, a lot of them sort of deliberately try to uh, fill in the gaps, but they don't provide historical reference at the time. What I mean by that is there would be things in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, that will you know, they'll mention an eclipse, or they'll mention an earthquake, or they'll give a name of a ruler or something like that that really establishes that when this was written, it couldn't have been written past this date, or it has the, the feel of historicity. Um, a lot of these kinds of texts, you know, just you know, lack those kinds of things, and so scholars tend to look at them wishfully, uh, any, anything from wishful to skeptical, but nothing that's really stuck. You've heard the theories that some believe that Jesus uh, migrated up to uh, Britain? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Jesus practically visited everywhere on the globe. <laughs> when you come right down to it, you know, it's Tibet, it's Britain, it's, you know, North America, South America. I mean, it. it you know, me personally, if, if if God wants to to do that, you know, if God wants to assign, you know, Jesus, you know, some other appearance somewhere else, I mean, that I'm not going to. You know, tell God He can't do that. I mean, the new, what, what, the way it's usually looked at is, is the Book of Hebrews in the New Testament says things like that when Christ ascended to heaven, He sat down, and now He rules at the right hand of God, so on and so forth. And you don't have any of these other uh, appearances uh, after the ascension in Acts chapter one. Well, yeah, that that might mean that you know that part of Jesus' job is over, and He's not going to visit anyone else. But on the other hand, I don't. I don't see where that's necessary. The only thing I would be concerned with is, is the message consistent? Um, you know, Jesus supposedly shows up over here. Is what he says there consistent with what he said when he was back over here? I mean, because you're not going to have Jesus being schizophrenic, you know, where, you know, like he forgets all that he taught over here and now he's teaching something completely different. Um, that would, would speak of incoherence to me, but, you know, scholars just, just would like to have more to hang their hat on in this area. Next up, East of the Rockies, Michael Heiser. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Michael. Uh, this is Michael in Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed your many appearances uh, on this program since 2001. I think you uh, carry the great tradition that Jesus talked about when he said that scribes uh, bring forth uh, old and new treasures uh, out of the scriptures, and you certainly do that every time you appear here. Well, thank you. Uh, I do have a problem in the sense that uh, I think we need more than a scribe to be uh, coupled with you in your appearances on these programs because, as I was chatting with Tom Danheiser uh, during the break, uh, some of the great questions that trouble uh, ordinary people and philosophers alike about Christianity and the direction that it has taken over the 2,000 years of its history, uh, some of those questions never really get dealt with uh, in a program of this kind, and you have an excellent opportunity to do so and that you, you have such good graces with uh, the, the people of Coast to Coast and, uh, and, the, and this great audience of 10 million people out here. Uh, I'd like to see you handle some of those, I mean, deal with some of those tough questions with uh, some uh, strong critics on the other side of uh, the table from you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, you know, you had the debate and everything in Wisconsin, but it really didn't get tough like uh, I'm going to do right now with a question and many more that I could ask. But just one question I uh, promised uh, Tom Danheiser, and I'm going to give it to you. Uh, there seems to be an apparent contradiction between the Father God and His Son, who showed such great kindness in uh, giving up His Son and the Son Himself being willing to mm -hmm. die a tremendously torturous death uh, for the sake of humanity. There seems to be a great contradiction in that picture of a God and this other picture of a God who forms beings out of mortal clay leads them into a, a world where they're totally blind and ignorant except for a single instruction about not eating of a certain tree, and then condemns them according to many traditional Christians. Uh, you say you are part of traditional Christianity. Mm -hmm. Then condemns them to be tortured forever and ever in the most inhumane terms imaginable. I mean, there's no Hitler, there's no Saddam Hussein, there's no Stalin, there's nobody that comes uh, uh, close uh, in, in cruelty to, 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 to this God. Now, these are tremendous contradictions, and I don't expect George Norrie to put his life on the line and risk uh, uh, the future of uh, his safety, his family's safety, and, 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 and all his colleagues at Coast to Coast by debating uh, these things with you, but somebody <laughs> needs to come out there and do it. And uh, if you can't find anybody, I'm here, and you're welcome to call me. But uh, serious, philosophical, and just ordinary people really want to have these questions dealt with. 
Well, you've, you've, you've presumed a couple things in the way you've structured the question. You know, some of, some of the presumptions are less important than others. A less important presumption would be that this thing about humanity being blind and ignorant and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see that as all, you know, at all. Giving them one restriction, I don't know how that equates into them not knowing anything else. In other words, I, I don't think there's a disconnect there. Uh, in the way you've structured the question. The whole thing about, you know, the, the God and the Son that arrange, uh, you know, for the, the gruesome death of the Son versus the Creator God and so on and so forth. You know, the way I would approach that, you know, on a number of levels, and then we get into the, the hellish, and I don't, I don't know how much time George wants to allot to this, but I don't really see much of a, of an inconsistency there because God creates it's very clear in Genesis that his intention is to share his rulership and his goodness with humanity. He gives humanity this one uh, rule to follow, as you put it. You know, I think it's a little more complicated than that, but we'll go with that. And then, again, as I said before, I think the, the, the cost of making them genuinely free beings is that they're genuinely free beings. They choose you know, to, to violate God's goodness. God had given them everything that, that he could possibly give them other than to make them robots, and I don't think that's a good thing. If I were making humans, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want them to just be robots because how, how do, even if I'm self-interested, even if I'm a totally self-absorbed God, how do I get anything out of that? Because they can't choose to, to do good to me voluntarily. What have I gained? You know, so I think God makes the, the choice to give them freedom. They use it which, of course, God knows. And then rather than destroy them, God says, well, I need to suffer because of them. I don't really see how, that, how that's uncompassionate or incompatible with God's original intent. Now, you also presume that there's no other response, there's no other answer to the hell question other than eternal torment forever and ever and ever. That shows me that, that you, haven't really, you haven't really read too deeply in, into not only the recent discussion of hell, but also the, rare, the very ancient discussions of hell. Your question presupposes that traditional Christianity has only approached this in one way, and that just isn't true. For instance, if you, if you want to go to Revelation, you can build a decent case for, for annihilation, because it says that death itself is destroyed in the book of Revelation. That would suggest that we don't have an eternal, eternal torment. And that's just a simple textual observation from the book of Revelation. I mean, again, we could just go on and on. There's lots of layers to, to that view and the, and the traditional view, you know, the, the one that you're, you're probably thinking of, and other options as well. And they all derive from the text. You know, I, I can say this to the Coast audience. I view that the hell question, the hell issue, I don't think it's as important doctrinally uh, as some other things that I would view as, as what I call now, this isn't original with me, but what I call Christ-centered or Christocentric doctrine. It's just a fact as you read through the Bible that there's greater clarity on certain doctrinal issues than there are others. And the ones that have the greatest clarity are centered in the person of Christ. Those that don't, are there is just less clarity. And hell is something that, that the church has not had one monolithic position on. And so I think the presumption that you bring to the question is flawed. And I'd be you, certainly willing to, to do the round table. George likes round tables. I love round tables, and, Michael. And I think that would be fun. I think they get a lot of different views in, and uh, we get a lot of perspective from people. So, uh, you know, the, we will constantly do that. You know, you, you, you brought up hell. And I was thinking of the movie, What, what Dreams May Come, mm -hmm. where, you know, Robin Williams went looking for his uh, wife mm -hmm. who committed suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that there is that kind of existence somewhere? Are you talking about the what what the, uh, the kind the of the good side that the character finds, or hell, or both? The the bad side of it. Yeah, I I tend to believe. You know, I I can build in in my own mind. I can build good cases for three three or four different views. I will answer the question this way. I I think that. How about when we come back? Okay. Go we'll ahead. do that. We'll take the break. <laughs> Back in a moment, and the rest of your calls. Okay, Mike Kaiser, we're talking about three views of hell, and hopefully you're going to talk about it from the perspective of not looking up when you tell us about this. <laughs> That's good, George. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 
you know, on some level, you know, I, I sort of will agree with the caller, the previous caller, against myself. That, that hell doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know, to me. Well, you know, for instance, if Christ, you know, paid everything, you know, why do we have hell? And if, if everything, all the sins are covered, why do we have hell? So there's this, there seems to be this, this disconnect there as well. I, I think the answer to that is, I think there's some sort of, we'll call it punishment, that's needed. You know, whether there, whether this is eternal or if it's a one-shot annihilation or you just die and that's it, whatever. Um, again, all of those can be argued from, from the New Testament depending on what's emphasized and how it's approached. But I think the reason that there needs to be some punishment is that God cannot just change or withdraw the offer of, of salvation. And what I mean by that is that you know, God comes up with this way to redeem humanity because he loves humanity. The price is fully paid, and that, that's Christ. And he needed an eternal being, an eternal person to pay the price because you have to cover all of humanity, past, present, and future. It can't just be anything. It has to be the, the Son, as the caller said, because the Son is eternal, and the Son becomes incarnate to fulfill the sacrifice. So that's one aspect of it. The price cannot be paid in any other way. So in a sense, God ties his own hands. Now that, that might sound a little awkward, but he ties his own hands, and he hopes that, that people will believe. Because he can't just say, you know, person A comes along and says, well, I don't really like that plan, God. I don't really like the fact that Christ died for me. I'd, I'm just not going to believe that. I'm going to reject that. I, I'd like option B. And God would say, well, I, I can't really give you option B, because option A has already occurred. And if I just change it for everyone then I didn't really need an eternal being, and the death of my own son was meaningless. And so, like I said, God kind of ties his own hands. So the reason that there's punishment is partly God's fault, if we want to say it that way, the path God chose. But it's also a, hum a, a person's fault for rejecting the offer that was given. And I think that's the more fundamental issue that we need to be thinking about. If I was God... I mean, let's just presume this. I mean, if I, if you're God or if I'm God and we create this world and we create these beings and they just essentially, you know, give us the finger, we would have every right to just say, well, I'm done with this, you know, just wipe everybody clean and, you know, forget you. But God doesn't do that. For some reason, the question is not, you know, who, who doesn't get in, but why does anybody get in? <laughs> okay? Yeah. That, that's the grace of God. Why does anybody get in? Why did God even bother with that? And I think, you know, we, we just need to look at the internal logic of, of the way the New Testament presents this. And, and you, you know, you see that once God makes the decision, you know, he, that's the decision. And he can't just change it for everybody, because then that makes the sacrifice of his own son a, a meaningless act. I, I'd like the free will portion. Yeah, I'd like the free will, too. I'd, <laughs> I vote for that, too. Let's go to the phones again. First time caller line, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hey, well, thank you very much for putting me on the line air. My um, pleasure. Um, I'd love to give you some roundtable on your health topics, but um, I, I had a, a question. You had uh, mentioned that you would love to put your hands on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I'd noticed that the History Channel had actually tracked it all the way down to Axum, Ethiopia, and my question was, have any of the followers of God ever put their hands on that notion? You know, this. this is... You know, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the Graham Hancock view, even though it's not original with him. It's been around for quite a while, but he popularized it through the uh, the book, The Sign and the Seal. Um, I have one problem. You know, the 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 Al Aqsa Mosque, or not the Al Aqsa, but the Aqsa Egypt in Ethiopia. You know, going down further here, I want to get my geography right. Um, that has a lot to commend it. That view has a lot of explanatory power to it. The one thing I, that bothers me about it, and Hancock, Hancock quotes a medieval text, 12th or 13th century, some guy named Abu Saleh, who said he saw the Ark of the Covenant was brought out for, for some ceremony. Yeah. But if you read the description, the description has the Ark encrusted with a cross and other jewels, that is not the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament. And in fact, it, if the Ethiopians, the Abyssinians, were afraid to touch it, then you have to ask the question, well, who put that stuff there? In other words, Hancock's description in his book does not include the entire commentary of that medieval guy. And you start to see that there are inconsistencies with the description of what he saw and what you would expect from the Old Testament. So that leads me to doubt that either that it leads me to doubt that they really have it now on the other hand 
they could have just trucked something out that the, uh, uh, one that they made that looked like the ark and dressed it up and made it a Christian symbol and they really have the thing there. That's possible because I think Hancock makes a good case for getting it to Ethiopia. I think Hancock doesn't do a very good job of explaining what the ark is, uh -huh. but he does a good job, you know, with that. And so I, I, I sort of favor that view, but I recognize that there are problems with it too. Okay. All right. Thanks for being on the program. Appreciate that. Next up, international line. Where are you calling from? Uh, hi, this is Sage from Toronto. Hi, Sage. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, gentlemen, and morning. good season. Um, I'd like to ask two brief questions, if I could. Uh, one directly, Mike, um, and then one more, um, if I could. Um, do you believe, is it your understanding, or do you believe that Jesus, when he died, even maybe as far as at the cross, did he did he die first with the mindset of I am a Jew? Oh, I think I think Jesus knew he was a Jew uh, to the moment he died. Well, that that's what he was ethnically. I don't, you know, he. I think Jesus had a grasp of his his human identity and also his divine identity. Okay, that is good, fair enough answer. And if if you don't mind, the second question which is um, during the, um, I'm not sure how to phrase it, I'm not that familiar with the Bible text, but um, during the, um, uh, what would you call it, the fight at the end? Mm -hmm. You're talking um, about Armageddon? Armageddon. All that stuff, yeah. Right, where um, Jesus would be uh, theoretically fighting off the, um, uh, what do you call the man that would be coming in, the pretty-faced man, the deceiver? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. Thank you, I'm sorry. The Antichrist. Okay. And it may supposedly take uh, take shape in Jerusalem, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Is it true, is it your understanding that if this was to take place, say, in Jerusalem or Israel, that it is true that the Israelites, uh, the ones who... When Jesus wins that fight against the Antichrist, that the Jews who who recognized Jesus, and do you believe this literally, recognized Jesus as the winner and did win in fact, the Jews who recognized him as the Lord and Savior, the one who has finally come, uh, do get to go to heaven, and the ones who don't do not get to go to heaven. I'll be listening for your answer on the radio. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks for the question. Well, I think I think that that question is sort of the same question that was asked before. God makes the offer; the offer needs to be received. If if I can I can conceive of that happening that that before their very eyes they see Zechariah twelve uh, fulfilled. I'm speaking of the Jews now, and they go, "Wow, this this really was him." Um. I think that, that at that point they do have the, the the choice to accept the offer or not. I don't think they're automatically well. It's too late now, buddy. You know, I, I don't I don't see it as that. I, I I do think that there is an element. If you go back in the Old Testament, and look at the Day of the Lord, which is the Old Testament term for what mm -hmm. we usually think of as Armageddon. Yeah, on the one hand, it's always very negative. You know, there's lots of killing, there's lots of violence, there's lots of climactic description. But there is all the day of the Lord is also the time when God sets things right. In other words, the, the curse is reversed. Um, it, it, it is the beginning of the great reversal, um, and so it, it's also a positive time as well. It's positive for anyone who wishes to align themselves with. You know the, the God of Israel and, and, and his his Christ, his Messiah. Mike, didn't almost every civilization, almost every c civilization since the beginning of time, always think we were in end times? Yeah, that, there, there's always been. You know, a, the, a scholar would say you really have the blossoming of apocalyptic literature in in, ter in a Jewish context after the exile because then in their thinking they sort of needed it. Well, the reality is, and, and scholars will admit that this, that apocalyptic stuff has been around a lot longer than that. Um, so I think your observation is actually the, the, the correct one. I mean, you've, you've, you've got this sense of there's going to come some point in the future when essentially we're going to get punished for either the things we've done to each other, the things we've done to the creation, 
you know, on and on the list goes, that, that at some point it's just going to come back to bite us, you know, you know where, and there's going to be this climactic time where everything is going to have to be set right and everything gets sorted out. That, that, that's very old. Let's go to our wild card line. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Hi. Good morning to both of you. Thank you. Good morning. I listen to you all the time, George. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I have a theory about evolution and creation happening, um, both. And here's how I arrived at that. Um, I have a theory in regards to the evolution of man being almost like a higher animal. Supposed to have been evolutionary over a period of time to probably what we are today and what we could be like God in the future. Then I have this thing about creation that Adam could have been the first man, first complete um, genetically perfect human being in the universe that God had made because there was an interruption in evolution according to Genesis. If we look back and see the angels fell from heaven, uh, came from heaven uh, down to the earth and made it with women of the earth, couldn't have been that the bad seed, the evil where God had to interrupt because somebody interrupted the genetics of what God created to be an evolutionary man? Which way is evolution working in your idea? Is it progressing toward a better thing or toward is it, is it a downward progression? Well, seeing it was interrupted, it would have been a downward uh, progression. But if it wasn't interrupted by the fallen angels mating with the women of the earth who created the giant slater um, and monsters, mm-hmm then I'd have to say that we went the opposite direction because of the interruption. We would have been on the road to being created, I mean, being created by so, God. So there was, an, there was an upward progression until Genesis 6. That's my theory, and um, I wanted to see what you people thought of that. And also, the Ark of the Covenant, you were just speaking about that in Ethiopia. The Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be in that building in Ethiopia with, the, um, with that tribe. The covenant that comes out around the city during once a year, I think mm-hmm. it's once a year, mm-hmm. it is not the one that's inside the building. Right. The one right. In, right. right. The one inside the building never comes out, and there's only one person that can go near it, and he's been guarding that for, I don't know, as long as he was, you know, uh, the priest or, or the, um, the caretaker or whatever you want yeah. to call him. That, that's why I left that loophole there with, with uh, Hancock's half quotation. I don't think the half quotation necessarily invalidates that, but it, it you know, it, it leaves, it, it's a weakness. It's a weakness in the view. Right. The other it's, thing not, I wanted, it's not fatal. I'm sorry. The other thing I wanted to say here is our moder- um, modern scientists today are looking at the genetic of all the human population. They were supposed to have uh, genetic size, the Neanderthal man. I'm not saying this correctly. I've got a bad, um, a bad jaw. The Neanderthal <laughs> man. Close and they enough. said there is no direct genetic link to us modern humans from that man on. So I'm thinking evolution was interrupted, and there came the evil with the fallen angels. Hmm. What do you think about the theory? It's as good as any. What do you think, Michael? You know, I, I, I'll actually have to think about that. The the only, the thing that doesn't that makes me hesitate about it is that if you assume an upward progression until Genesis six, you really haven't dealt with the the expulsion from Eden. In other words, if you said that the that that there was a, a, a progression, you know, that, that the humankind as it was would have been getting better and better and better and better while they were in the garden prior to, you know, being driven from this paradi- paradisical place. That would seem a bit more coherent, but, but once they're expelled from the garden, um, that seems to be, at least it was in the Jewish understanding, that that's where the downward progression begins, and that's actually prior to Genesis 6. But, you know, I'll be honest with you and tell you that, that I... 
you know, I will think about that. I'm thinking about a number of things associated with Genesis 6. I spend a good deal of time there. But that that's something that I view as an obstacle to what you're saying. Do you believe in the devil, Michael? Yeah, I believe that there is a there is a being that is the, the arch rival of God. He's not the only one, but I think there is one. How, how, you know, obviously he is not God, which means he's not as powerful as God, but he's pretty darn close, isn't he? Yeah, he would be, in, in biblical parlance, uh, the, the, the being we call the devil, that becomes known as, as Satan, um, he is a divine being. He is an Elohim, but uh, that, that, re that requires spending a little time that we probably don't have tonight on what exactly is an Elohim. Uh, he's certainly very powerful, but he is not the creator, and he's on a leash, too. What do you mean he's on a leash? He's on a leash because all things that are all things that derive from the Creator are ontologically inferior to the Creator, and you can't have everything. You can't even have evil happening just willy nilly, as though God has has no control over it or, or no use of it as well. Because as soon as you say that that this act over here that God is powerless to do anything about it, then you essentially have a dualistic system or a, or a purely polytheistic system where where essentially it's a free for all and there is no sovereignty at all so that's why i say that even even evil even the evil acts of humankind god is powerful enough to put himself above them and be able to manipulate even evil toward a good outcome he has to be superior to it and in control of it well, i got to tell you, Michael, very thought-provoking tonight, and uh, we will have you back. Maybe another roundtable discussion as well, okay? Sure. You you think up the, t the topic and let me know. All right. You take care. Michael Heiser. His book, one of them, The Facade, his website, Michael S. Make sure you get the S in there. MichaelSHeiser.com. We've got a whole week of great coast-to-coast -coast programs for you. Friday, by the way, Art will be here doing his annual predictions show, so make sure you're part of that program. For Dan Delonte, Kiris Coburn, Steve Carr, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasor, Ian Punnett, and Art Bell, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. I'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be